Good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you all for coming, uh, especially on an evening when there is a march against Islamophobia and against the latest reactionary measures of the new regime, can you call it that, uh, in Washington, the new government, new administration. Um, I'm Rashid Al Khaldi. I'm the uh, one of the co-directors of the Center for Palestine Studies. This is the first uh, event that we are hosting uh, this semester. Uh, we're very, very happy to uh, do this as part of a, uh, a uh, series we call Palestine Library, where we, we feature books on Palestine. Uh, and our topic tonight is a book by Ben Ehrenreich entitled The Way to the Spring, Life and Death in Palestine. Um, I'm going to say a couple words about Ben and about the person with whom he'll be in dialogue this evening, um, the noted author, Colm Fadin. Um, but before that, let me just say a couple of general, make a couple of general remarks. Um, you know, we're living in a time of extraordinary, strange events. Um, and on the surface, it may appear that uh, as far as the issues are concerned, many of the people in this room, uh, probably everybody in this room, or you wouldn't be here, the uh, Palestine issue, things are going very rapidly in uh, the wrong direction. But to mistake those important events for the entirety of what's going on would probably be a mistake. Um, the fact that we have, by my count, around 100 people here to listen to a book about Palestine means that an enormous amount has changed. Uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you could not have done what we are doing tonight. And that represents the real current in this country, the current that certainly is uh, an important current on university campuses, current that's really uh, very, very important within the Democratic Party, the base of the Democratic Party, not the plutocrats who own, control, and dictate what happens in the party, but the people who actually vote for the party, the people in whose interest the party supposedly speaks. And that's true in many, many sectors across this country, in important parts of the Jewish community, in important uh, sectors of this country. So um, in this time of impending, shocking, perhaps, events, uh, insofar as domestic policy and insofar as the foreign policy of the new administration, um, I don't think we should ever lose sight of that. Um, we actually are a majority <laughs> in this country. Uh, I'm not talking about the popular vote in the election. I'm talking about how many people voted for this, this president and how many people didn't vote for this president, either never went out or voted against. It's a large majority. And on the issue of Palestine, things are changing rapidly, uh, much more rapidly than I ever would have dreamed possible uh, seven years ago when we started the Center for Palestine Studies. This is the first and only such academic center in the entire northern and southern part of the Western Hemisphere, in North America and South America. It's one of three in the entire world. Um, and we've managed to establish the center at Columbia University where uh, 10 years ago, uh, many of us were under quite ferocious attack. And yet, the center is thriving. Uh, we, we are, we're doing you know, as well as could be expected. We've packed the room tonight. We're very, very happy about that. Part of that is the people who you're going to be listening to, Ben and Colm Fadine. Um, <coughs> let me talk first about Ben who is the author of two earlier books, the novels Ether and The Suitors. Um, he is a, a, to those of you who know Harper's or the New York Times Magazine or the London Review of Books, he writes often for all of those publications. Um, he's a recipient of the National Magazine Award. He lives in California and he wrote this book uh, in, as a result of his experiences in Palestine, uh, from which he wrote some quite extraordinary journalism. Um, in dialogue with him will be Colm Fadin, who is the Irene and Sidney B. Silverman Professor of the Humanities at Columbia University, and who is visiting with us this, this I think this semester, is that right? Yes. Um, I have a, this is a very distinguished man, and I have a very lengthy uh, biography, which I won't read at length, and he's waving from the back saying, no, don't read it all. But just let me tell you a little bit about him. Um, he studied in Dublin, he lived in Barcelona for a number of years. He wrote two books, uh, a novel, The South, which was shortlisted for the Whitbread uh, and was winner of another award, and another book entitled Homage to Barcelona. He worked as a journalist, uh, was a very distinguished journalist, and his, uh, some of that work was collected in a book entitled The Trial of the, Trial of the Generals. Uh, other 
work as a journalist and travel writer includes Bad Blood, A Walk Along the Irish Border, The Sign of the Cross, Travels in Catholic Europe. Um, he has a number of novels. He's maybe best known as a novelist. He has, I think, eight or nine uh, novels. Um, his novels include The Heather Blazing, another award-winning book, Story of the Night, another prize-winning book, The Blackwater Lightship, shortlisted for a uh, uh, the Booker and for another important prize and which was made into a film. Uh, the Master, winner of three different prizes and shortlisted for the Booker. Brooklyn, which won the Costa Novel of the Year Award in 2009. Um, he has several short story collections. He has about a, a eight or nine other books. Um, he has honorary doctorates from three very distinguished universities, including the University of Ulster, University College Dublin, and the University of East Anglia. Um, many of you has re have read, I read him regularly in the, in the London Review, where he's a contributing editor, and in other, other places like the New York Review of Books. Um, he's visited at every one of the prestigious universities you can think of, besides Columbia, uh, Stanford, UT Austin, Princeton, Manchester. Um, and he has a couple of books that have just come out. His eighth novel, uh, Nora Webster, was published, I think, in 19, 2014 or 2015. And uh, his book on Elizabeth Bishop came out with Princeton last year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there are many other things I could say about both of them, but I think it would be better for all of us to listen to them. So join me in welcoming Col Colm Toybin and Ben Aronwright. Thank you very much for coming. Um, ben, um, you're very welcome at Columbia. I, I wonder if you could start by giving us a very brief history of um, the West Bank, Gaza, the settlements, the outposts, <laughs> um, as to how this has occurred, to what extent, when it began, um, and, and how it has grown. Just, just so we have a very clear context for what we're doing. Sure, we, we have until about 10 tonight, right? I said brief. Uh, um, thank you about Rashid and, and Nadia for bringing me here and, and to the center for bringing me out here and for the important work um, that's done here. Um, I think it's always contentious to figure out where you begin a history. Um, usually these histories are begin in 67 or 48. I think it's probably important to actually start in 1917. We're um, approaching the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration because I think in understanding what's happening in, in Palestine, it's very important to understand the colonial context from which it emerged. Um, if the Balfour Declaration, if these words aren't familiar to people, this was uh, Lord Balfour, um, the uh, British foreign minister at the time, um, de um, wrote a declaration swearing the, um, that the British crown would support the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. That wouldn't happen for another 31 years in 1948. Um, in 1967, I'm jumping ahead, um, in uh, the Six Day War of that year, um, Israel took over the West Bank, which was under um, the administration of Jordan um, between 1948 and 1967, and Gaza, which was the um, under the administration of Egypt, as well as uh, the um, the Golan, which was until then part of Syria. Um, my work focuses on the West Bank, um, and beginning really almost immediately after the occupation in 1967, um, a group of religious nationalist Jews um, in Passover of 1968, I believe it was, um, went to Hebron and with the permission of the Israeli military um, decided to spend the night in Hebron. They told the, the, the Israelis that they wanted to spend a Seder there in this very holy city um, and they would need to spend the night because they couldn't drive back late because it's dark. Um, and the military said, fine, and they stayed and wouldn't leave. Um, and that small community of quite zealous um, religious nationalists ended up becoming the nucleus of um, the, the very first settlement um, there, which became the, the government eventually built them, Kiryat Arba, um, 
which is a large settlement just outside of Hebron. And they've since then spread into Hebron. And the movement that some of those same people started, um, mainly in the mid-1970s, began establishing settlements throughout the West Bank. Um, and usually this meant just a few people um, bringing a caravan or camping out on a hilltop, and the Israeli army immediately coming to protect them. Um, but if the army is there, if there's an army base, the army base needs electricity, and it needs water, it needs phone lines. So very quickly, you would have a, an actual settlement there, and they've all since been normalized. Um, I believe 40% of the land of the West Bank, someone may know if this, uh, this number is, I'm a little bit rusty, is correct, um, has been taken um, by the settlements um, in, in various ways. And this has continued under every American regime. You know, Obama and Netanyahu um, famously didn't get along very well, but the uh, settlement expansion continued quite quickly under Obama as it had in the past. Uh, the difference was that um, when Netanyahu would make an announcement that he was going to build 1,000 settlements or 2,500 new units, as he did today or yesterday, um, he could expect criticism from the Obama regime, and none came this time from Trump. Um, we're going to view it, obviously, because of your book from the Palestinian side. But just before we do that, I, I wonder if you could also let us know from the Israeli side, why would Israelis wish to go to the West Bank and form settlements? In other words, I, I, um, there are times when you consider the impulse to be economic. In other words, rich Israelis don't go to s in, in, into the settlements, A. But B, there's something much more difficult to deal with, which is the religious question, which is the idea that this is, as Benjamin Netanyahu said, the land, he's talking about Hebron, the land of our forefathers. Th this idea that somehow the land actually belongs to the Israelis in some fundamental way, which has to do with religion, and, um, and that they feel fundamentally it's theirs. And that this is part of the reason why people really can move as though o almost like 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 early like like, uh, like early settlements as though they need that there, there there is a religious reason for them to do that yeah i mean the, the the settlers who established hebron and many of the other now you know um old and respectable but once quite radical and and um zealous settlements um like eli or, or shiloh um were members of Gush Emunim, they were religious nationalists. And many of them understood, um, had a vision of the land of Israel, which had nothing to do with the contiguous internationally recognized boundaries of Israel. And people have sort of measured in different ways, but for, you know, for some of them include most of what is now Jordan and large chunks of Syria as well. Um, and the, the more zealous among them um, believe, you know, with all of their being, um, that it is, it is God's plan for Jews to live in these places. Um, most of the governments that have ruled Israel have not been quite so religious and have ha found uh, realpolitik and secular reasons to um, support this uh, ongoing. Um Has that support been uneasy at times? Yeah, there, there's a there's a, there's always been a tension, I think, between the sort of radicals in the settler movement and the Israeli government. Um, I think that tension shouldn't be overstated, though. I mean, sometimes you know things will happen, like you know there'll be an outpost. An outpost is a sort of a settlement in nucleus, a sort of embryonic settlement that hasn't yet been approved. Um, but you know there'll be so-called illegal outposts, which are illegal even to the Israelis, that the government, the Israeli government, will try to evacuate. And there'll be a, you know, there've been, in some of the ones in the Nablus area, there've been even sort of riots where the settlers will attack um, the, the soldiers who come to push them out. Um, I think it's very easy to look at this from afar and think there are these crazy settlers who are, for, who are sort of tugging Israel and forcing Israel to do this. Um, and that, I think, overlooks all of the vast levels of institutional and financial support that the Israeli government have, has given to the settlement enterprise all along. So th there is this tension, but I think it's, it's a tension in the, in the context of, a, of an overwhelming support. Um, you mentioned illegal even from the Israeli point of view, and I just wonder if you could take us through the strangeness of the legal situation um, of um, who lives under civil law, who lives under military law, and indeed the use of Ottoman law 
um, which which was perhaps the strangest part of this story in, in the yeah. earlier. Yeah, um, it's a it's a it's a complicated situation. Um, since the the Oslo Accords in the mid 1990s, um, the West Bank has been divided up into three zones: um, areas A, B, and C. Um, area C is entirely under Israeli control. The military controls everything. Um, it also controls all aspects of, of civil life. There's, there's no other authority there. Um, area B, the Israeli military controls security and the Palestinian Authority controls civil life. And Area A is ostensibly at least under the se full security and civil control of the Palestinian Authority, although for the most part the Israeli army enters whenever they want. Um, one of the um, sort of horrific things that this means is that um, Palestinians and Israeli Jews um, live under completely different systems of law. Um, so Palestinians who are arrested for any reason at all in the West Bank are tried under military law. Um, this actually predates, predates Oslo. Um, but uh, which means they can expect very few due process rights. Um, the, the, I, I've spent more time than I would have liked to um, at various trials in case uh, you know um, in the is in the Israeli military courts, and there's a, there isn't even really a. Um, they don't try very hard to make it look like justice, um, and it isn't. Um, I believe the, the figure for the conviction rate for Palestinians accused in the Israeli military court, the last time it was made public, which was 2010, I believe it was 98.6% conviction. It might have been 99.6. Someone can, can check my own footnotes on this for me. Um, so th this, this is not even a semblance of justice. If a, um, an Israeli is arrested for the same crime um, in the same place, they will have all of the protections of Israeli um, civil and criminal law. They will be tried in a different court um, with a completely different set of laws and due process protections. Um, they can expect different sentences for the same crimes. Um, it is a, as, as clear an apartheid um, an instance of apartheid as, as one can find. And then of course there are all of the laws which Israel has sort of cherry-picked um, in order to do what it wants in the, ter the territories that it has taken. And this actually predates the occupation in 1967. Um, many in the, the parts of, of what is now Israel that had a, a large Palestinian population, um, Israel decided to keep the British emergency laws, for instance, which allowed them to um, you know, to imprison people without trial um, as administrative detainees um, and allow them, give them many excuses for taking people's land, many of which go back to Ottoman, um, to Ottoman law. So they kept the laws of the British, the British mandate period, which Zionists actually despised um, while they had to live under them, um, and also kept uh, certain parts of, of Ottoman, or kept all of Ottoman law and enforced certain parts of it, um, which they have used to take a great deal of land in, um, within the West Bank and claim it as state land and then hand it over to settlers. When did you go there first? The first time I went there was actually as a tourist in 1997, um, but I went there for the first time as a journalist in 2011. Sorry, could you just take me through the first time as a tourist as to where you went and what you saw? I, I mean, this, yeah. is, this, is, this is interesting simply because anyone who goes to Tel Aviv for the first time, I think, can be very shocked by the amount of excitement that's there now. I mean, the nightlife, the, the beautiful ease, the restaurants, the you know, sense of Mediterranean um, leisure. Did you, f did you find that? You know, I think even on that trip, and it was a very different world then, I think it, the, the signs of... Um, a kind of violent separation and equality were clear to me. Um, they, were, they were harder to see then. There was no wall there then. Um, there weren't checkpoints. This was before the Second Intifada. Um, but I think I, I saw enough, um, and I, I wasn't there, I, w I wasn't talking to political people. Um, I was just there visiting friends. And I know I went to the West Bank. I was not aware that I had crossed into it. Because in those days, there was no wall. You could just drive back and forth. Um, and but nonetheless, I think I saw enough that I felt distinctly uneasy in places like Tel Aviv, that the, that kind of, uh, the sort of brittle hedonism um, that um, does attract a lot of people there, 
felt to me quite um, quite strained and false. In 97? Even in 97, all the more so now. Right, and, and, and then you went back in? I went back in 2011. Right. Uh, so could you just describe, for example, what your method was going to be? Uh, you, you know, I mean, I mean, in other words, did you know you were going to write a book? Did you have a commission to write a book? Not yet. I mean, I went there for one magazine story in 2011 for Harper's to write about the role of water in the occupation. Um, and um, we can get into this if people well, want. But why don't we start with that? I mean, I mean that, is th that is a really important story, the role of water in the occupation. Could you, could you talk about that? Sure. I mean, um, the, the largest aquifer in the area um, lies mainly under the West Bank. Um, and um, most Oslo sort of froze Palestinians' ability to access this um, to, to very few, very few wells. Um, and Oslo also prevented, or the civil administration has prevented, um, Palestinians from digging any new wells of their own. Um, so they're sitting on all this water that they don't have access to. Um, and if you go to a settlement, you will notice, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the wonderful, uh, the cliche is that the, the desert has been made to bloom. And uh, certainly in the settlements, you will find flowers everywhere. You'll often find, uh, you know, swimming pools, beautiful landscaping, even in the, the less prosperous settlements. Um, and if you go to the neighboring Palestinian villages, you find, uh, you know, water is conserved very, very rigorously. Um, people have very, very limited access to, to water. Um, it, it's another way in which the, these inequalities, these structural inequalities are, are absolutely obvious. Um, in the village where I spent the most time, um, which is a, a small village named Nabisala, um, just outside of Ramallah, um, where they don't have it particularly bad in terms of water compared to a lot of other places. Um, their water would come once a week, um, and by the end of each week, um, the water pressure would be diminished almost to nothing. The last couple of days of the, w of the week, the floors wouldn't get mopped. Nobody did their dishes. You didn't flush the toilet. Um, and you know, by the very end of the week, the, the taps were basically dry. Um, and of course, in the, the settlement on the opposite hillside, water was, was completely abundant. I suppose just before I take you back into more detail uh, of things that you witnessed, and wrote about in your book, I, I wonder if you could give us a, a, just a, another brief history of how did Oslo happen? I mean, how did this agreement get made about what things, for example, water or area A, B, and C? I mean, how did this occur? Under whose watch and, and why? Um, there, there, there are certainly people in this room who could answer this in more detail than I could, but I think the, the, the quick answer is that um, you know, Oslo came at the end of the First Intifada. Um, the PLO was in exile um, in, in Tunisia, um, which meant the historic leadership of the Palestinian Revolution um, had grown more and more distant um, from the people who actually lived there. And the First Intifada was an extraordinary grassroots uprising, um, largely nonviolent. Most of this history um, is, is not remembered here now. Um, and um, grassroots to the extreme. I mean, communities, village by village, um, you know, doing for themselves what the Israelis would not would not do, and what they would not let the Israelis do anymore. Building, you know, community clinics, um, communal farming, uh, their own schools, because the Israelis were shutting down the schools, et cetera. It was this absolutely vibrant uprising, especially in the first few years. And I think one of the things that meant was that for the traditional hierarchy of the PLO was that they felt um, they felt their own role slipping away from them. And in many ways, I think for Arafat and those around him, um, Oslo was their only chance. Um, Oslo you know, <coughs> presented them with the possibility of returning to Palestine, and they made a lot of bad deals. Um, and you know, th I think they, they did so under, under pressure also from, from outside parties, such as the US. But I think Arafat's logic throughout that was that, um, this was temporary. Oslo was supposed to be a temporary agreement, um, you know, until a, a final status agreement could be made. And at least it was a foot in the door. They would have something like, not quite a state, but something like one. Um, and with that, they could continue to negotiate and get a better deal. Um, so I think they made a lot of compromises that in other situations they would not have been willing to make. Um, but what it's meant was the, the, the PA was created as a, 
a really sort of castrated body. Um, the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority, yeah. yeah. Um, that has sort of the semblance of an authority, um, but the in all, um, all ways that matter must defer to Israel, um, and that the real power has remained with Israel. Um, when you went in to write the book, what rules did you have, or what models did you have? I actually didn't have any models. <laughs> um, I mean, I knew I wanted to do something that would be quite different from from anything that I had been read, uh, that I had that had been written by an outsider. Um, that you know, most books that I saw, not just books, but you know, documentaries, uh, you know, journalistic accounts that were written by by non-Palestinians, um, would either focus on the kind of high politics, you know, what went on, you know, between the, in the, the higher echelons of the leadership on both sides, or would take this meticulously balanced approach. Um, so we're gonna tell you a nice story about a um, Palestinian teenager in the Janine refugee camp, and also about this nice kid from, um, from Tel Aviv and how they met and their, you know, the sort of wha what happens on each side. So there's always this really strained attempt to create a balance that always struck me as absolutely false and, um, and worse than false, because I think it, it, it allows us to think that this balance exists in some ways on the ground. And one of the first things you see when you get there is the one thing that characterizes this situation is its radical imbalance, um, the, a radical imbalance of power, a radical imbalance of resources, a radical imbalance of despair, an imbalance of fear, an imbalance of grief, all of these things. Um, and to try to be truthful about the realities that I was seeing, I think meant not trying to impose that kind of false balance and, and not making an attempt to also tell the story from the Israeli side. That's been done, many other people have done that. Um, so I, I, I didn't want to, I wanted to as much as I could to focus on the realities that I was seeing um, as they were being experienced by Palestinians um, and not to try to dilute that with a, um, you know, a constant Israeli interlocutor. Uh, obviously your aim too is not to make the book timeless in the sense that it's very much set in a certain year, certain few years, uh, you know, in certain places, so that you do have to, and I, th I think it's one of the things that really works in the book, give us every so often a, uh, an account of what is happening in the larger, you know, uh, in, in Jerusalem, in, in Washington, uh, you know, in efforts to make, to create a settlement, or efforts that failed to make a settlement. I mean, that has to be there in the background as you're actually staying with families and writing t things in detail. I, isn't that correct, that, it, that, that, that you're not interested in creating a sort of timeless portrait, but a, but a particular photograph of a particular time? Yeah, I, uh, absolutely. Um, but I think some of the questions that, that motivated me um, were things that went beyond the, the immediate things that I was seeing and experiencing. I mean, I think the, if, you know, if there's one question that kind of pushed me to write this book, it was, what does it mean to resist? And I think this is a question which I didn't know this would be quite so relevant um, in such a painful way here, so quickly. Um, but what does it mean to resist when you are up against something infinitely stronger than you um, and you have no obvious means of conquering it? Um, you know, the. The book came out of uh, an article that I wrote about this one village, Nabisala, where um, at that point when I first went there for about a year and a half, they had been marching every day, every, uh, every week, every Friday, um, to try to reclaim a spring which had been taken by um, settlers in the neighboring settlement. And men, women, children in this tiny little village would march unarmed. Um, and kind of as soon as they came around the bend in the road, without fail, every Friday, the Israeli army would meet them and start firing tear gas at them and start shooting rubber bullets at them and occasionally start shooting live ammunition at them. Um, and from the beginning, they knew that this small group of people could not beat the Israeli army. They weren't even trying. They weren't shooting back at them. The, the young men would throw rocks, but that's also a completely, you know, you know, not a, it's not a strategy that's gonna work against a heavily armed Israeli soldier in any, in any immediate way. And, 
yet they kept doing it. They lost two young men, which in a, a village of, of 600 is an extraordinary loss. Um, every household had somebody who'd been arrested. Every household had been damaged by projectiles fired by the military. Um, and they kept losing. And they kept losing. And they kept losing. And there was no hope that that would ever change. And yet they kept going. And uh, that, I think, was trying to understand that. What gets people to keep going um, when, there, when there seems to be no hope of success? Um, you know, Palestinians have a there's, a, there's an Arabic word which you hear a lot when you go to Palestine, which is samud, um, you know, forbearance, um, which is for precisely this quality, you know, for, um, for standing up every time someone tries to push you down um, and, and refusing um, to surrender. And, and trying to understand what that meant. Because I mean, as, as someone who's been writing about various struggles around the world for you know, my entire journalistic career, um, you know, th th these were questions that were urgently important to me and certainly are not losing any relevance. Could you give the audience a picture of when you say the Israeli army uh, um, of what that looks like when you see it? Um, I mean, there's something very particular about, for example, the youth the fact just how young these kids are in, the, in, in their big military that, that doesn't look like what the British Army used to look like when in Northern Ireland, for example, they were older, they were professional soldiers. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure most of you know there's mandatory conscription for both uh, um, boys and girls uh, in Israel. So they're mainly very young, you know, 19, 20. Sometimes you'll have um, older officers. But um, there are these kids uh, wearing you know, fatigues, um, carrying Galil rifles or, or M16s, um, usually in, in body armor. Um, they look and are uh, quite hard to beat if you just have a, a rock or nothing at all in your hand. Um, and they are, I think, it's sometimes hard to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll read, um, I'll talk to Israelis or I'll read things in the Israeli press and I know, th you know, Israelis understand this is, this is their youth. These are everyone's children. Um, and there is a, a great deal of loyalty among Israelis for the, to the IDF. Um, and I think it's hard for Israelis to see them as Palestinians see them. Um, and which is with those, the barrels of those guns pointing at them um, when it, pretty much all speech is orders and curses. Um, and when every encounter with them um, contains an extremely high risk of humiliation. I, I probably like a hum humiliation is like a, a 90%. Um, and a very real risk of, of death or injury or imprisonment. Um, and they are a constant presence in people's lives. You know, if you're, if you're driving around the West Bank, you're going to have to deal with them at checkpoints. If you're in public transport, they're going to stop the public transport and make you get out and search you. Um, they are, they come into villages, um, they're, you know, they're a part of everyday life. Um, you mentioned earlier, you know, the extraordinary small spaces we're talking about. I mean, this, this is not a huge country and that um, on the West Bank there are settlements and outposts from the Israeli side and there are Palestinians living in villages. But could you give us an idea, I mean, this might seem to, somebody here might think, well, well, they live beside each other. Surely they get to know each other or they see one another or they have some deep sense of one another's lives. Could you give, s give us a sense of the architecture or the, um, um, the technology used to make sure this isn't the case? Um, yeah, I mean, the, w the one place that's an exception to this is Hebron, which I know you visited as well, um, where which is the only city in the West Bank with an Israeli settler presence inside the city. But for the most part, the separation is absolutely complete. Um, you will have settlements, usually on hilltops, um, always with a perimeter fence, um, you know, which also has various electronic surveillance uh, and you know, security attached to it, um, with little checkpoints at the entrance to every settlement. So you know, Nabi Saleh, where I spent a lot of time, the settlement across the way is Halamish. No one I knew in Nabi Saleh had ever had a conversation with someone from Halamish. And I talked to people in Halamish. No one there had ed ever had a conversation with someone in Nabi Saleh. Um, and they sometimes do, you know, have confrontations. Um, but the settlers' ignorance of 
the lives in the villages that they are next to is, is fairly absolute. Um, and Palestinians also. Uh, there was a, a Belgian filmmaker made a documentary while I was there, um, and half of it was devoted to Halamish and half to Nabi Saleh. And he's, uh, yeah, he did the half and half thing. And he screened it in Nabi Saleh. Um, and I, I was there for the screening. And it was the first time most people in the room could see inside their, like behind the walls of their neighbors, you know, the community right across the hill. That every time they went outside, they had to see it on their land, right? Um, but it was the first time they'd seen inside it because none of them had been inside it. And they, you know, they saw the bougainvillea and they saw the, 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 the swimming pool. They saw the beautiful gardens and they just watched in absolute silence and awe. And I asked them later, like, what, what did you think? They said, it's beautiful. I mean, that, that wasn't a, you know, there was pain when that, when they said it. Um, but it was the first time they'd seen it. It had been there since the mid, you know, since 1977, I think. Um, I if you were giving, if there, since there are students of journalism here, or that those of us who'd like to be better journalists than we are, if you could help us to just to describe to us how you start then. I mean, what do you do first? Do you make contacts here with groups there? Do you just turn up and look friendly? I mean, how do, how do you get people to trust you so they don't think somehow that you're their enemy or, or that they sort of let you into their houses? I mean, I mean, there is a, there I mean you end up in the book with, in a state of great sort of intimacy with the people, you, you, you actually know not only, uh, obviously you know their names, but you know who's related to who, who suffered in which way, who's coming back from where. You do get to know this very small group of Palestinians. <coughs> How do you begin with that? Um, beginning is the easy part. I mean, I, I think the thing that, that creates that trust is sticking to it. Um, you know, I, I feel fairly sure that the family that I spent the most time with, that when I first got there, you know, they uh, they understood um, that being open to foreign media was the only thing that was going to prevent them from getting just crushed by the Israeli military. Um, so well, I mean, having a yank in the house yeah, helps. Nope. Yeah, I mean, nobody really wants, like, a journalist in their house at all times taking notes on everything they're doing. It's creepy. Um, and um, I think probably for the first week or so that I was there, you know, I, I was certainly just another another foreign face. Um, it probably helped that I got arrested quite early on, um, and could you, could you describe that for us? Yeah, it was it was fairly normal. Um, there was a, a Friday demonstration, and on that particular Friday, the Israeli army decided to arrest all the foreigners. Um, and there are always foreigners present, um, you know, solidarity activists usually, and they swept me up with the with the activists, and they let me go after a couple of hours. It was it was not particularly traumatic. Um, but uh, but that definitely helped. But then I think the thing that really helped was just that I kept going back. Um, and you know, when somebody, I was there at funerals, I was there in the hospital when somebody got sh hurt, I was there, uh, you know, when somebody came back from prison, I was there outside the, the prison to, you know, welcome them back and go back with them to the village. Um, just, I think eventually, um, you know, that kind of trust is very hard to build and it takes, it takes commitment, as it does in any kind of relationship, I think. Did, um, did you feel a sense of despair among them over any possibility that this situation is going to be rectified in any way in their favor? I mean, I, I mean, in other words, yes, on every Friday they went this sort of ritual, going to the well, going to the spring, but, but uh, the larger picture. Yeah, yeah I think people... Um, People live with despair constantly, um, and I, I think that's that that sort of took me a, a while to figure out that hope and despair are not they're not foreigners they're not they're not strangers, um, you know just like people who uh, have the deepest religious faith also no doubt better than the rest of us do. Um, I think people who engage in a um, political act that seem to require inhuman hope also are uh, sort of in a constant battle with despair. Um, which sometimes wins and sometimes they're, 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 they're able to overcome. Do they understand the role of the United States um, in their particular plight? Absolutely. Um, and I, I think something I've tried to stress always whenever I've you know, been traveling and talking about the book is that uh, it's easy to think of these things as happening far away, but they are not. Um, 
one of one of Obama's last actions was to um, sign a deal with Netanyahu that would give them thirty-eight billion dollars um, over ten years in military aid, three point eight billion dollars a year. Um, that level of support, plus the kind of diplomatic support that we extend to Israel, um, means that we are not a bystander in this. We are a very in a very immediate way a participant in these hostilities, um, as much as we are in Iran, as uh, Iraq, as much as we are in Afghanistan. Um, and um, that responsibility, while it's clear to me, um, is absolutely clear to everyone in, in, in Palestine. Um, you know, the, uh, the tear gas canisters, you can pick them up and look at them and it says made in USA, they're made in Pennsylvania. Um, and um, so people are, are very much aware of that. Could you take us through a few things um, about the structure of Palestinian society? Um, let me start with education. Um, what sort of access to schools? Um, how is this funded? How does it work? Uh, the schools are, are, are funded by the, the PA. I actually don't know those details very well. Um, no, no, but just, but just what you, I mean, as a witness, that the kids went to school in the morning. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, like in Nabi Saleh, the, the kids go to school in the village up until a certain age, and then um, when they have to go off to secondary school, they have to go to the next village over, and then if they want to pursue their studies further, they have to, um, they have to leave the, the area a little bit, a little bit farther away. Um, and, uh, you know, education is extremely important in people's lives. Um, and I think Palestinian society is among one of the best educated societies in the world. Um, this despite the many obstacles that the occupation um, puts in place, um, which go from you know universities being shuttered, which was a, a constant during the Second Intifada, to uh, more temporary um, <coughs> irritations like the army doing raids on campuses and firing tear gases while you know university students are trying to um, study. Um, some of this is fairly unimaginable in a um, place like Colombia. Um, that soldiers might just storm in and start shooting tear gas and arresting your classmates. Um, but if you're at Bir Zayt or um, in Abu Dis, this, this happens with alarming regularity. Uh, take me through something like school books, um, printing presses, um, how, um, access to computers, um, Wi-Fi. Um, just take me through how that works. Uh, Wi-Fi is, is uh, everywhere. <laughs> um, I mean, everyone's on the internet, everyone's on Facebook. One of the first things people ask you is, is uh, you know, if they can friend you on Facebook. Um, and um, one thing that is quite different that you notice immediately when you um, go from Israel into the West Bank is there are no Palestinian, um, there's no 3G um, on the Palestinian um, cell phone companies that Israel has prevented um, the Palestinian cell phone companies from having data. Um, so you can, you can get a Palestinian SIM card, but you can, this may have changed a little bit the last year, but I don't think so. Um, you can make f voice calls, but you can't get online. You have to um, have an Israeli SIM card in order to do that. In, in order to get online? Um, on your phone, yeah. yeah. Could you uh, describe to us um, if you're um, in the West Bank and you're Palestinian and you want to leave the country? Um, for example, if you wanted to, under if, uh, if um, the new president decided he would like a lot of Palestinians to come on a visit to the United States, uh, how would they do this? Um, <laughs> it's extremely difficult um, because not only do you have to get the visa um, from the country you're going to, in this case, let's say the US, um, but you have to get to the embassy. Um, and the American embassy, many countries have a consulate or an embassy in Ramallah. The US does not, um, doesn't have a consular office, it has nothing. Um, which means to apply for a visa from the Americans, you need a permit to enter Jerusalem from the Israelis. Um, and for many Palestinians, that will never come. Um, you can apply and it simply will not be granted. Um, so I've, uh, you know, I've known people who've had to jump the wall um, to sneak over um, you know, risking prison and risking, you know, worse if they're caught, um, in order to get to the American embassy to keep a, an appointment um, for a visa interview. Um, 
so uh, you know, I knew people. I knew people on the is on the Israeli side who were constantly kind of ferrying papers back and forth between various Palestinian villages um, and and various embassies um, because Palestinians could not cross freely in order to do that. And if you did get the visa, how would you leave? I mean, what airport would you use? Uh, you would not be allowed to to fly out. Uh, you know, the the international airport in. Um, in Israel is David Ben Gurion, which is outside Tel Aviv, uh, and you would not be allowed to cross through Israel to get it, which would mean you'd have to leave um, by land into Jordan and fly out of Amman. Um, and that border crossing too is not necessarily a smooth one. Um, it is ostensibly controlled by the PA and by the Israelis and by the Jordanians, um, but the main presence is the Israelis. And kind of behind all of the PA guards, there is an Israeli making the actual decisions. Um, so that crossing um, frequently involves lengthy interrogations, humiliation, humiliating searches, etc. Um, and so people can kind of count on it, that all of these crossings um, will be fraught with, with danger and difficulty at every step. S since the walls have been built, could you describe to us how you would get, if you were a Palestinian, to work if you had to go on the other side um, of such a wall? If you could just in some detail just describe that particular thing. Yeah, I'll describe um, the Kalandia checkpoint, um, which is the one I know the best and is the largest one. Um, some of you may have had the pleasure of crossing through it. It is the checkpoint between Ramallah and Jerusalem. Um, so because these are two large population centers, um, it is you know, the busiest of them. Um, to get through it, you pass through, a, this, this, there's this sort of, the, the, the outside, of, you know, you're coming up against the wall. Um, which is at this point completely scarred um, from the many clashes that have occurred there. Um, often it smells horrible, because if there's if there been a clash recently, the Israelis may have uh, fired something called skunk water, um, which uh, in, in Arabic is called shit water, because um, that's what it smells like, which they fire at a, out of a water cannon to um, try to disperse protests. Um, so it stinks of that. It often stinks of from, from burning tires. Um, and then you get into this, this building, this sort of warehouse-like building, um, and your first choice is between which of several sort of caged corridors um, you can walk down. And you never know, if there isn't already a line there, you never know which one is open and which one isn't. Um, so you have to kind of go down them and find out. If there's already a line, and there's almost always a line, you just get in line. And the you start out um, in this, it's sort of an oblong cage, more or less exactly the width of, of an adult male who's not very wide. Um, and um, when it's busy in the morning, um, there can be hundreds of people there waiting to cross. Um, and you're all pressed up against each other, um, and there's nowhere to move, and if you're at all claustrophobic, you will not enjoy yourself at all. You finally, from there, you get through their um, sort of small turnstiles, then you're in another sort of cage um, where you're up against a another turnstile, like the big subway turnstiles, the tall ones. Um, and on the other side of that, you can't see them, is the spot where you will have to talk to an Israeli um, soldier, which is usually a 19-year-old, often a woman, um, sitting with a couple of her, his or her friends, looking at Facebook on their phone. Um, and occasionally barking something in a Hebrew, which no one understands, through uh, a PA system, which is about as ancient as the ones in the subway here. Um, so you occasionally will hear these kind of incomprehensible orders being barked at you. Um, before you get there, you have to be buzzed in. People are buzzed in three at a time. Usually this means that at least one person every time is stuck between the rungs of the turnstile and has to wait there in, the, in a sort of tiny triangular cell um, until you are buzzed forward, until they finish with the people there and allow you to pass through. Um, then you pass through. There is a um, conveyor belt, like the ones at the airport, which you put your bags in, and if they tell you to, you put your shoes in, even if it's raining, even if the floor is wet. Um, and it, everything, by the way, is filthy. Um, and 
you have to walk through a metal detector. So you know everyone already has their belt off by the time they get there. If you have any jewelry off, you have to take that off. Everything has to come off. Um, sometimes you have to pass, just like at the airport, you have to pass through a few times before this happens. Um, most Palestinians who cross frequently um, will, their permits will be, um, will come up through biometric means. So, you know, if you just have, a, some will just have a piece of paper which they'll put up against the glass with their ID and the soldiers will sort of at their leisure look these over and decide if they want to let them pass or not. Um, if you're someone who crosses a lot, you'll put your hand into the biometric reader um, and hope that they will let you pass. And sometimes they will let you pass and sometimes for one reason or another, they will decide that they don't like your permit or they don't like the way you look or perhaps there will actually be, if you're very unlucky, a security hold on your permit, which means that Israeli intelligence wants to talk to you for some reason. And then while you thought you were just gonna be going into work, in Jerusalem or to a doctor's appointment, instead you will have to go into another room where you'll wait and wait and wait until somebody comes to question you. Um, certainly when, when um, the troubles in Northern Ireland were at their height, th this was the most dangerous moment in a way because if you were taken into the room and if you were, taken for too and if you were there for too long, the suspicion grew around you that you had been telling people, that, that, that you had been telling the British, or in this case the Israelis, uh, you know, th things about your neighbors, and it left you in a very vulnerable position. Is this, uh, is this a big problem? Does it, is this something that arises? Yeah, of, of course. I mean, the, the Israelis, this is not something people like to talk about, um, but the occupation works in some large part um, because the Israelis have coerced people to informing on one another. Um, you know, particularly when one crosses tries to leave the country um, th over Allenby Bridge to get into Jordan, um, or when people in Gaza try to, uh, you know, are given a permit um, and allowed to go into Israel, they're frequently interrogated at those um, at those crossing points um, and told that they won't be allowed to cross unless they begin to give information. Um, and there are various other ways that that people the, the that the occupation uses to coerce people into into informing. But it also means that like nobody knows, um, nobody knows who's saying what. You know, somebody may get a call from the Shabak, from the the Shin Bet, the intelligence service, to come in um, for an interview, um, and their family will know. Everybody, all their neighbors will know. They got a call from the Shabak. They have to go to the Shabak, um, and they'll have to spend most of the day sitting there waiting for this interview, and of course, suspicions will will arise. So this is this is also used in order to you know to break up trust within Palestinian society. You mentioned the use of Hebrew, uh, and I wonder if you could tell us about the military courts and, and how they're conducted in the question of language, in the question of the charge sheet, the question of, of what, you know, what language people are speaking in, what language the suspects understand, and, 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 and this, just the strangeness of that. Yeah. I mean, uh, everything happens in, uh, um, everyone, uh, everyone there basically, except for the lawyer and the defendant, is a soldier. Um, the guards are soldiers, the translators are, so are soldiers, the military lawyers, the prosecutors are soldiers, the judge is a soldier. They're all wearing uniforms. Um, and the proceedings all occur in Hebrew. Um, and there is usually a translator there, usually a, a Druze um, enlisted soldier. And it's kind of a, so much, you know, I've spent a lot of time in American courtrooms as well. And if you spent any time, you know how much goes into these sort of rituals of decorum. You can't, you know, if you're addressing a judge in the United States, you have to sit up straight, you have to ta stand tall, you know, you'll be yelled at by the judge if you're, if you're, you know, if you're not showing, you know, the proper amount of respect for these proceedings, which you, which you show with your body, um, with the, you know, the nice polished wood in the courtroom, et cetera. Um, in a Israeli military court, um, you know, they're, they're often in sort of, um, converted containers. Um, they're, everyone is kind of slumped in their seats, usually not the judge, um, but the translator usually is. The translator is often looking at their phone and every now and again remembering to translate a few lines for the defendant who's sitting there while their fate is being determined um, and you know, in a language they don't understand. Okay. Um, the, I suppose um, the, the, the question really we want to ask is um, if you were to su if you were to suggest ways in which uh, oh yeah no sorry there's one other thing I want to ask you about which is the question of Ramallah that the fact that the um, 
as you say, the United States does not have a consulate or an embassy there. But the European Union has, has really uh, be become involved in, in actually making a sort of new place out of Ramallah, that um, every European country has a, you know, has a diplomat there. There's a sense of Ramallah as a city now filled with new restaurants, filled with cars, filled with people are bringing you fridges home. There's a, you, all these banks have arrived. There's a, there's a sense that the European Union has actually had an effect on Ramallah. Did you, would you like to talk to us about that? Yeah, I mean, Ramallah is a, a very strange place. Um, you know, Ramallah was um, not that many decades ago a um, sleepy sort of mountain getaway. Um, it, it's, it's high up and it's cool, so it's where people from other parts of Palestine um, would go if they could afford to in the summer when it was too hot elsewhere. Um, it was apparently a very beautiful city. In the years since Oslo, it has, um, you know, there are apartment towers everywhere where once there were olive groves. Um, it's a very busy, um, you know, terribly unplanned, um, messy place. Um, but it's a place with a lot of wealth. It's sort of boomtown. It's a boomtown, and it's it's a sort of Oslo boomtown. Um, and you know the word people people use is the the Ramallah bubble. Um, and uh, Ramallah, even without calling it the bubble, just the name Ramallah for people in much of the rest of Palestine has kind of a bad taste um, because it has come to symbolize the elite that has emerged um, in the years since Oslo, um, an elite whose um, whose fortunes are very much tied to the continuation of the status quo. Um, so there is a great deal of resentment in the rest of, of Palestine towards Ramallah and towards the kind of soft life that it's possible to live there. Um, you know, because like I, I lived in Ramallah, it was, it was a convenient place to live. I could go to the gym, there were cafes. Um, the, you know, there's very little that we have in Western cities that, you know, wasn't, isn't, that isn't available to people with the money in Ramallah. Um, but you're also largely um, insulated from the realities of the occupation in terms of the, the immediate violence of the occupation. Um, you know, th there are frequently clashes at the checkpoints just at the peripheries of the city, but unless you go out to them, you know, you can stay for weeks in Ramallah and never see an Israeli soldier, um, and never sniff tear gas, and never have a gun pointed at you, and never have anyone ask you for your ID. Um, you see from the Israeli side, I think, um, in the West Bank, a plan. I mean, there's a constant sense that many, many people are putting great amounts of thought into where a road will, will go, who can be on that road, under what law that road is being built, uh, and wh what, what areas A, B, and C, what the differences between them will be. And, and it looks, I wonder, well, I, I'll, I'll ask you, I, if it looks to you, and if it looked to the people who you were staying with and seeing, that there was a plan, and the plan was effectively to move the Palestinians, all of, all of them, into a, a small area where they could be kept safe and where they could not cause any distress to settlers or people in outposts and where they would use, where, you know, they, they would be provided for, uh, but that they would simply move from small villages um, that are close to settlements, uh, just leaving the settlement alone, le abandon the village and go in to a city which they were allowed to be in or they're encouraged to be in, that there is an actual plan, a grand plan, a master plan. It, it's, it looks as though it's been done slowly, but it may be done more quickly now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think it's, there are times when it's startlingly clear. Um, you know, for instance, um, in 2014 was the first time that I experienced it when after three um, young Israelis were kidnapped in the West Bank, the West Bank was flooded with Israeli soldiers, and they shut down several of the key checkpoints. Um, and they closed down and sealed off, um, particularly the south of the West Bank. Um, but just by closing a couple of checkpoints, they were able to cut the West Bank into three parts, um, which meant that you were from Hebron, you couldn't get to Ramallah. If you were in Ramallah, it was pretty hard to get to Janine. If you were in Janine, you really didn't have a chance to get to Hebron. Um, and the military infrastructure has made it extremely easy for them to do that, to, to divide things up. Um, in terms of a long-term strategic plan, um, I think it's already happening that one of the results of Oslo and of settlement expansion and land confiscation since then is the, the Bantustanization. Um, that's an awkward word. 
of um, of the West Bank. Um, I, I think it's a word the Israelis are very uneasy about, isn't it? Understandably, yes, um, and they should be. Um, but I, I, it's, I think, a, a fairly accurate word. And what it means is pushing Palestinians, um, trying to push them out of much of the of the of the countryside into um, small population centers, um, which are isolated from one another um, and unable to, you know, so that the kind of unified re like resistance that occurred during the first intifada um, would become completely impossible because movement from village to village is impossible, movement from town to town is impossible, um, and. I think the the sort of long term goal, and I can't I can't quote any inte Israeli intelligence s sources, but like if you look at what's been happening, um, it seems like an attempt to make of the West Bank um, a few tiny Gazas, you know, just to concentrate the Palestinian population in a few densely populated areas which can be secured, which can be separated from the Israeli population entirely, um, and you know, if need be, can be bombed without hurting Israelis. Um, I think um, this this has been this has been going on for for quite some time. Um, in in this context, could you could you describe Hebron, the actual what the city looks like now? Because it, that doesn't fit into what you're saying. It's a it, it, it's a just could you describe? I mean, the center of the city and 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 also the way in which the different um, I mean, the way in which the Israeli settlements are focused in the city. Yeah, I mean, Hebron is, is um, probably the strangest place I've ever been. Um, I don't know how it, it compares to Belfast during the Troubles, but it, it's, um, it's the one city, as I mentioned, with an Israeli settler presence inside the city, which means there is also a heavy population of, of soldiers inside the in the city. There are, there are Israeli military bases inside the city. Um, and what has happened there since the 1990s has been, um, well actually I guess it was in the 1980s that the settlers began to take over homes inside of historic Hebron, le leaving Kiryat Arba, the, the, the settlement just outside, and taking over homes um, inside the historic core of Hebron. In 1994, some of you remember, a settler named Baruch Goldstein um, went into the Ibrahimi Mosque um, in central Hebron and opened fire on Palestinian worshippers as they were praying and killed 29 men. Um, the Israeli government's response to this was to seal off a section of Shuhada Street, the main, um, the main uh, thoroughfare, um, which at the time was still like a vibrant shopping street in central Hebron, um, to close businesses there um, and to seal it off to Palestinians. Since then, more and more of Shuhada Street has been closed, more and more parts of Hebron have been sealed off from Palestinians. Most of Shuhada Street now is completely empty. It's one of the spookiest places you'll ever go to. Um, the shop uh, fronts have been welded shut. Um, the windows facing Juhada Street of the buildings that are still inhabited by Palestinians have also been welded shut. So the people in those buildings can't leave their homes onto Shuhada Street. Sometimes they have to go over the roof and leave through their neighbors' homes. Um, it, the area has been rendered to, to borrow the rather upsetting word used by the Israel, Israeli military, has been rendered sterile. Um, of course, the infecting agent. I mean, that's a word they, I mean, ju just to be clear, uh, that is a word in common use. It's yeah. not just a word that you've thrown in. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's actually a technical term. Is that correct? Yeah. It, is a, it is a sterile zone, which means there are no Palestinians there. Um, where I stayed in Hebron was in the last Palestinian house on Shuhada Street, right before the point where Palestinians aren't allowed to walk. Um, so there was a... In this section of, of, of Shuhada Street, Palestinians can walk but not drive. Settlers, of course, can walk and drive and do whatever they want. Um, and foreigners, I could walk and drive and do whatever I want. Um, so the house I was staying in, if I walked outside with my host, um, who had lived there all of his life, um, we could both turn left and we could walk a few hundred yards to the checkpoint freely, um, as long as no one bothered us. Um, but if we want to turn right, there was a soldier right there, and he was there 24 hours a day, and he would ask for our papers, even though he knew us. You know, I was there every day. 
Uh, but he would, he would ask my pass for my passport every day, and I, I would give it to him. And once he looked at my passport, I could keep walking. But my host, who was Palestinian and had a green, color-coded Palestinian West Bank ID, um, would not be allowed to walk past that point. Um, and there are many of these um, junctions throughout Hebron, um, these like, heavily coded junctions where Palestinians can walk, but they can't do this, they can do this, but they can't do this, settlers can do this. Um, and the result is this absolutely dizzying form of spatial apartheid. Um, and um, this is, I think, the reason, um, or one of the main reasons, that so many of the people um, since October of 2015, um, when the, the, I don't know if it's right to call it an uprising, but when the attacks on Israeli soldiers and civilians began, um, so many of those have taken place in Hebron. So many of the people who have done them elsewhere were from Hebron. And of course, some of these, it's, it's fairly clear that, the, that there was no attack and, and people were just shocked because the soldiers were, were skittish or, or having a bad day. But, um, but many of them, you know, there were legitimate attacks. And, and I think Hebron, I think, is all of the, the rage and all of the humiliation um, of the entire occupation is sort of boiled down in Hebron to, to a sort of very thick paste. Um, which you feel there. I mean, the air is sort of is vibrant with fear and, and, and with hatred. Um, I, I'm worried that the questions I'm asking you are not quite doing justice to your book. I, I hope you're not worried about this, but you should be. Uh, um, which is, I, I wonder if you could just tell us, um, say, uh, I mean, just see if, you c if this question would help. What was the most shocking or the saddest thing you saw? Uh, I, I mean, just m moving away from the sort of global or you know, uh, where checkpoints are, but just, just a human thing, just people you met, houses you stayed in, things people said to you. Uh, um, the Olympics of sadness is, is fiercely fought <laughs> there, so it's hard to figure out what is the saddest. Um, um, one of the more painful moments was Bassem Tamimi, who's, if the book has a protagonist, it's probably him. Um, it was in his house that I stayed in Nabi Sala. Um, there was, uh, and he's w the, the main leader of the, the resistance movement in Nabi, Nabi Sala. And I met him once in Ramallah, um, and I'd seen him the day before. And I knew he was going to be in Ramallah. Um, we agreed to meet for lunch. He was wearing the same clothes as he'd been wearing the day before. He looked, he looked exhausted. I knew there had been a raid in the village the night before, that the army had come into the village, and there had been fighting with the village youth. And he was very quiet. And every time I'd ask him what, what had happened the night before, he was just sort of wouldn't answer. And, he, and w we were walking around, running various errands together, and he was, he was just very s silent and distant. And finally, after we'd eaten, we got on a, um, in a taxi, and uh, I asked after his son, who at the time was 17. Um, and he said that he had come back at 4 in the morning um, after this raid, and there had been a hole in his sweater um, just above his shoulder um, and from a bullet, a live bullet. Um, so in other words, he'd, he'd come within a couple inches of, of being killed. Um, and, you know, I asked, I asked him if he thought he could get him out of the village for a while, because at that time things were very hot and the soldiers were, were coming in all the time. And, uh, and he said he, he could ask him, but he didn't think he would, he didn't think he would leave. And he said, how can he when he sees what I do? Um, and that was really crushingly painful. Like knowing, suddenly seeing in a very immediate way what the cost of this resistance was for him. You know, that he knew that the path he had taken might lose him his son. Um, and yet he had no other choice, um, or you know he, he couldn't stop at that point. Um, at that point, his, you know his son would, would think him a coward if he stopped, um, and he also couldn't get his son to stop without being a hypocrite. Um, I, uh, there were <laughs> endless <laughs> other instances of sadness, and I hope a lot of laughter and, and joy in this book. Um, but I think that was a moment when the costs of that kind of resistance hit home and what it, what it really means um, to sort of only be able to win through your losses. Um, 
just before we come to the to the audience, I just want to ask you. Um, I wonder if um, you, you just just uh, just looking at the structure now of Palestinian society um, on the West Bank, that there's something missing. That in that in other words, wh what you describe in Ramallah being that world that that is uh, you know very comfortable. Uh, that that a lot of people have jobs. Um, a lot of people have bank accounts, and then at the other level, people in villages who really are cut off from the outside world. I, I mean, except that they have you know, information, but they have no full access. But there's no middle ground of the sense of a sort of civil society, of, of, of um, a, a sort of world being built where people are making connections via other forms of politics rather than direct politics, which, you know, we take for granted here. I mean, people join bridge clubs, football clubs, and, you know, s people have cinemas to go to, you know, all that world. That, w that we take for granted as being the fabric of our world, but actually makes up the world between, you know, abject need and power. Uh, that uh, just wonder if, if if you could talk about that, how much it's there, how much it's not there, and, and how it could be made. I mean, this is one of the the things that the um, activists I knew in in Palestine talked about constantly, that the kinds of connections between people that form communities had been so decimated that it was that was the in their eyes the biggest obstacle to political change more than the more than the occupation itself in some ways um, that Oslo had created the PA which has made a point of centralizing power in its own institutions and much of that has meant dismantling the grassroots support networks which came out of the, the first intifada and the, and the years preceding it. Um, so on the one hand, the PA kind of holding all power into itself, um, and on the other hand, the, the sort of pernicious effect of s all the NGOs that are there. Um, that, you know, if in, if in years past people had did things for themselves as a community, um, now there are all these NGOs, and if you, you know, th w they employ tons of people, they pour tons of money into the economy, um, and one of their effects is this kind of, uh, you know, neoliberal atomization that people. Sorry, could you, sorry, could you say that again? <laughs> they basically, that, that instead of uh, you know working with your neighbors to solve a problem, you hope to get a job in an NGO and get a grant to do it. Um, and, you know, th the other thing that I think has been really, you know, decimated um, these kinds of connections has been the introduction of, of debt, of consumer debt. Um, that, you know, part of U.S. policy there has been to introduce financial institutions that will create a market for Palestinian consumer debt. Um, it, you couldn't get a mortgage in, in the West Bank um, until, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago. That, that would have been impossible. Um, but the U.S. government has helped to put in place institutions which, at this point, the consumer debt is absolutely rampant. Um, and one of the things that means is that when people think about improving their lives, if, if they can easily borrow money, they can get consumer goods and improve their lives in their homes rather than having to look to their neighbors and organize and, and, and make political change. But it also means that people are that much more hesitant to disrupt the status quo, both because they don't have time because they're working all the time to pay their debt, um, and also because they suddenly have a lot to lose when they have a, a huge mortgage on the, the land that they live in. Um, I, right. We, um, I, it would be great if there were just questions, but if I suppose we can't stop somebody if you have a comment to make, but it'd be great if it was short. I know by looking at you it will be short. Um, <laughs> so can we start there? And have them come to the microphone. Oh, please. Uh, can you come Call. to the mic? That's okay. Yes. Thank you very much. A short question. Just to ask if, in all the time you've spent in the West Bank, have you seen any activities or organizations of scale or anything that could potentially justify the Israeli act, like uh, Israeli coup? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not working? Yeah, you're it's working. Uh, I'm Hatim Kanani. I'm a Palestinian citizen of Israel. 
and uh, I want to thank you personally for writing this book. And my question is, how did it happen that a mainstream, the mainstream publisher in the United States publishes something so sympathetic to the Palestinians? Thank you. Um, thank you, Hatem. Um, Who's the publisher? It's Penguin. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, th I think the uh, the answer. I think Rashid. I think started to answer it earlier. That I think things have shifted quite a bit in terms of U.S. public opinion. None of this is reflected in our the actions of our politicians. Um, but you know, when I first wrote about Nabi Saleh, it was for the New York Times magazine. I was shocked that the New York Times Magazine wanted to send me to a small West Bank village to write a story that was exclusively from the perspective of, of the people who lived there. Um, and I, I think slowly, you know, as long as I've been writing about this, um, I am sort of constantly seeing cracks in the wall, because uh, there has been more than I think any other issue in the US. Um, this is the one where the narrative is most tightly controlled, where certain perspectives are just not allowed in, um, Palestinian perspectives, that is. Um, and that has shifted, um, and I think it's shifted for a few reasons. Um, the main one, I think, is that, you know, the actions of the Israeli government are, even for someone who wants to be sympathetic to them, um, become increasingly hard to defend. And every time there's another war in Gaza, um, you know, a few hundred thousand liberal Zionists have deeper and deeper doubts about what's going on there. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we're, we're, we've been seeing this, it's, uh, you know, during the primary season, this issue suddenly was an issue that it was possible to talk about, when it, which it never was um, in other, you know, election seasons in this country. So I think there is this, this very slow shift. Um, and I think it's a, it's a powerful one. Um, and I think if we are not all thrown into absolute apocalypse in the next four years, um, it will mean that in the long term, it's much harder for the U.S. to um, be um, the you know, unquestioning supporter of all Israeli actions that it has been. Okay, um, please. I have a two-part question. Uh, in November, the uh, Interfaith Peace Builders sent a delegation, an African heritage delegation, to um, Palestine slash Israel. And they went to Nabi Saleh, and um, they reported back that the, the demonstrations have stopped, that they just basically gave up. Um, so the first part of my question is, and what is next for the Palestinian resistance? And my other question, also tied with African heritage and uh, the intersectionality of the Black Lives Matter movement is the Black, uh, Black Lives um, Movement put out a statement that what Israel is doing in Palestine is genocide. And would you agree? Um, part one. Um, yeah, they have stopped in, in Nabi Saleh. They stopped the weekly demonstrations there. Um, most of the other, there were several other villages around the West Bank which had been doing weekly um, demonstrations. Most of them are still doing them, but they've gotten tiny. Um, and you know, one of the things I think that my book records was this, the, the sort of slow, um, the slow death of this movement, which had once been a, um, a really vibrant one. Um, less and less people kept coming. Um, and I think the causes of that are, are quite complex. I, I think the, um, the last question that Colm um, asked, um, you know, explains some of them, the various ways that sort of uh, Palestinian civil society has been eroded over the years. What's next, I don't know. I don't, um, that is the, the last time, my last few visits um, this last year, those were the questions everyone was asking. I mean, everyone, the people I knew who had been involved in that form of popular resistance for years, all of them seemed to agree that whatever successes it had had, it was no longer working, um, and that they needed to do something different. Uh, so everybody was saying, we need to do something different, we need, uh, but, but nobody knew what. Um, and I don't know. I, I think um, it will come from the young. <laughs> um, 
you know, the, the, the uprising that we've seen over the last couple of years um, came mainly from very young people. Um, and that was not organized at all. Uh, you know, it was for the most part suicidal, uh, you know, a, a, a kid with a, a kitchen knife attacking an Israeli soldier. Um, but I am, I am confident that, uh, you know, people find ways to organize themselves and to, and to resist, and this generation is gonna have to kind of start from scratch. Um, in terms of your other question, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was, it was, I would have to come back every three months between visas while I was there. And, you know, every time I came back, another young African American had been killed in another, you know, American city. Um, you, you'd have riot cops, you know, shooting tear gas at um, young African Americans. And the scenes looked exactly like the scenes that I was seeing in Palestine. Um, and of course, this didn't go unnoticed. Uh, there were Palestinian flags in Ferguson. Um, and some of the, the people I knew in, in Ramallah um, were sending tips on how to deal with tear gas to the, to the kids in Ferguson. Um, but uh, the question about genocide, yeah, it's an incremental genocide. Um, and I think that um, that's a word that gives a lot of people pause, and it certainly should. Um, we don't see the absolutely mass slaughters, although in Gaza, I think we've seen something very much like it um, that we usually associate with genocide. But the attempts to erase a people, um, to just erase them, to erase their history, um, I think follow a logic that can only be call, called genocidal. I mean, every time someone says, and people say this all the time, I get it on Twitter all the time, you know, there's no such thing as a Palestinian. Um, or there, were no, there was nobody there um, when the Zionists arrived. Um, these are genocidal statements. Um, these are attempts to erase a culture, erase a history, um, decimate a people. Um, and I think uh, they should be, be recognized as that. Ben, I just, I just, I just want to take you up. I, I, I want to take you up on that. I, I think that's a, a from the Israeli side. I think that would be a very, very loaded thing to say, and a very difficult thing to accept, considering the, the thing that we haven't mentioned, which really uh, we have to put in some context. Just since, since you're doing this, is the Holocaust. I, you know, I, is the idea. I think we know what genocide, genocide is in Europe, and um, you know, it's, it's a very loaded word. I, I just uh, just would like to really push you on it. I, I'm, yeah. I'm very uneasy about l letting this go just as simple, ju without without questioning you one more time about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, this is why, w for one reason, I, that I say an incremental genocide. Um, but I wonder if there's an another word you could use. <laughs> I, I mean, I just, I j I'm just, I'm just uneasy about it, and I just, I'm and just and and you should be, and we all should be. Um, and I think it's an especially painful thing to talk about, um, given the history of the Holocaust. Um, and uh, you know, as, as you know, someone with, with a Jewish background, it's extremely painful for me to use that word. Um, it's it's more painful to see those realities, um, and those historical ironies are 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 brutal. Um, but I think that you know, I mentioned the Balfour Declaration because I think this always has to be put into a colonialist context. Israel is a settler colonialist society, and the one thing that settler colonialist societies have in common is that they follow a genocidal logic. The one we're living in right now, um, you know, every single one of them, whether it's you know, South Africa, Canada, the United States, Australia, and Israel, um, places where settlers came in and declared a land theirs and did everything they could to either um, remove the people who were already there or, or so erase their history that they could pretend that they weren't there. Everything you've been describing so far s is the same thing, identical to what we normally consider fascism as far as the military occupation regime that you're describing. And as a retired military uh, attorney who's represented Guantanamo prisoners, I know how this is uh, spilling over into our own system, the occupation and legal regime that Israel is using in the West Bank and, and Gaza. And uh, I guess I wanted to add that uh, Netanyahu's father, who was an admitted fascist, and now we are getting that taboo on calling people fascism, and recognizing tabu, uh, fascism. Uh, we, we're seeing it here at home now. Uh, so I guess, is that term coming to be used more to recognize what is really taking place under the guise of military occupation, which really is a continued form of combat. It's not something benign. 
And, uh, and if you look at Pinochet's Chile, that was actually not even as extreme as what you're describing takes place every day in occupation, uh, occupied Palestine. And the second part of that question would be, uh, as been described, occupation law is simply the will of the military commander. So I wonder how extreme does it get? I've, I've read and heard that kids writing graffiti on the wall, for example, can be put into military detention, administrative detention, at the will of the commander. Is that something you've seen? And could you describe a little bit more that military regime, occupation regime? There's really a distinction between occupation and martial law and military law, with occupation and martial law being what the fascists always use. Um, I, I don't think we have to use the word fascism at all, unfortunately. Um, you know, I think the, um, you know, the French occupation of Algeria, um, you know, certainly resulted in um, similar horrors, um, and most of us are probably not gonna call de Gaulleist France fascist. Uh, the United, uh, the American occupation of Iraq, um, we probably will not use that word to refer to, uh, to the US um, in the early 2000s. You don't have to be a fascist, you can be a, a nice functioning liberal democracy um, and unleash really, really, you know, horrific horrors on um, your colonial dependencies. Um, and, but yeah, I think uh, one of the really difficult things in, uh, for, you know, Palestinians to deal with is the absolute opacity of the occupation authorities. Um, that people don't know what they can, wh what they will be arrested for, they can basically be arrested at the whim of a soldier. Um, and administrative detention, which has been used, you know, more and more commonly, um, especially over the last two years. Like, you don't know. You don't know what the charges are against you. Um, you have no idea what the evidence is against you. That's all secret. Um, and you're hel hel held in jail for periods of six months at a time, um, and then you go to court, and you don't see the evidence against you. You don't know what the charges are, and the court decides whether or not they're gonna hold you for another six months. Um, and that is, uh, you know, um, that doesn't need much more comment from me, I guess. Thank you again for your book. It's beautifully written, and you've put a human face on the Palestinian story, and not just the conflict. And going to the uh, question about the publisher, um, yes, there is more in the, in the news and in publishing and things like that, but as a noted journalist and respected journalist, have you been interviewed by mainstream press like a Charlie Rose so that the story isn't sort of being told to a known audience? I watched you at the Jerusalem Fund. Um, is it being put out there with these kinds of really pertinent questions so that people who don't know the story can finally start to hear the Palestinian story? That's my question and my statement that speaks to erasure of a culture. When I was there the first time, I happened to go to Yad Vashem. It is a gorgeous museum and you process through and you come down to the very end. And you know how sometimes when you go to a museum or shopping, you see the same group of people because you're on the same timeline. And I <coughs> happened to be speaking with this group of men who were here from the United States and they were being toured through by an Israeli tour guide. And we chatted, and they were there on a pilgrimage, if you will. And it was all American men from synagogues, et cetera. And we got to the very end, and it's this gorgeous vista, probably the best I've ever seen in my travels there. And I heard the guide say, the last two hours have been very hard, been really, really difficult. But this is our reward. This is all ours and they were looking at Palestinian villages. Or they were looking at a landscape where there once had been villages, yeah. Um, um, I should say, um, I think Penguin also published this because I have a courageous editor, um, and I think he knew that it, it, would, uh, it would certainly take some heat. Um, and, in terms of media coverage, I'm not going to complain about not getting on Charlie Rose. Um, but, um, you know, I think there are still barriers to talking about this in the mainstream press. I think it's also worth saying that the degree to which I've been able to jump over some of those barriers um, is because I'm white and like, have a recognizably Jewish name. Um, that, you know, 
a Palestinian telling these stories and telling their own stories um, is still not getting through to the places that that you know I'm I'm given some some free passage into, um, and that has not changed, um, and I think that will take um, a lot longer to change. Okay. Um, yes, please. I think we'll take one last question. Is that is, is, is that okay then? We'll take one last question. Okay. Beautiful book, but um, a quick question: um, Who is the the technology company that makes the recognition software that's used at the border crossings? Is it HP? I believe it is HP. Yeah, um, I mean there is a there is a boycott campaign against HP mainly for that reason. Um, I, I I don't want to end on that. So so just 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 <laughs> let me ask you if if you could sum up by telling us how you think this situation could be improved in the short term? I, I, mean, I, I mean, just if you could think of five things that would make a difference now, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to, to ask that question because, uh, you know, your book in a way isn't a book that's um, coming out, you know, saying, I think I know what the solution to this is. It's very much a piece of passionate witness. But arising from your passionate witness, is, is, is there anything in particular that you would want to, you know, you know, I if um, the new president asked you to come and see him, I mean, I mean, Al Gore went to see him, so you never know. Um, if he asked you, you know, what should he I'm do? I'm actually going up to Trump Tower as soon as we're done. Well, yes, well, good, but I mean, what should he do? I mean, what should um, Angela Merkel do? Um, I, I mean, I've very consciously resisted um, suggesting solutions, because I think uh, Americans have a long history of um, trying to find solutions in the Middle East that make things much, much worse for everyone. Um, so my answer is, I mean, I think the one thing that the US could and should do is stop funding this. Um, that, you know, as I said, <laughs> those $3.8 billion a year um, mean we're not innocent in any of this. And I don't think the U.S. should make, you know, even pretend to be able to, you know, push both parties towards peace um, or to be any kind of honest broker in this or to have any pretensions um, at, be, at pushing uh, things towards a solution until we stop being such an enormous part of the problem. Um, and that $3.8 billion a year, a year has a great deal of cost in, in Palestinian lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, thank, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Colm Todin. Thank you, Ben. Um, we have an event on February 6th. I want to tell you about it. It's a film screening of a film called A Man Without a Cell Phone by Sam Mehzabi. Uh, and it will be at 6.30 PM in Dodge 511. Um, my, my the, my, my favorite film critic tells me it's an excellent film, uh, very, very, very good. Um, and the, uh, the filmmaker, uh, Sam Hazarbi, will be here uh, for the screening of his film in conversation with our colleague Hamid Dabashi. So uh, February 6, 2017. One last round of applause for Ben and Paul. Thank you.